out. <laughs> All right, here we go. This is for glory. Dude, I can't believe I'm getting to drive a bus like this. <laughs> <laughs> He's getting airborne in the rear. Now. Oh! Hey, I did it! I won! <laughs> Spot the excited Mythbusters. <laughs> yeah! Despite the protests from the tires, the bus made the turn. But just like the movie, only just. I cannot even tell you what an adrenaline rush that is. <laughs> this is like a sickness. It's like an addiction. I gotta rip up another one. But the problem with addictive highs are the inevitable subsequent lows. I know I'm a myth buster, but I'm a little sad to find out that the trick is so easy. Ladies and gentlemen, kids, welcome at the University of Twente. My name is Stefano Stramizoli, and I'm professor of robotics at this university. It's my great pleasure to have you all here, but of course to have the Mythbuster. I'm the, what is called the honorary promoter of the Mythbuster. And unfortunately, Jamie cannot be here, but we are very happy to have Adam here. Ladies and gentlemen, Adam. Thank you. Thank you so much for the warm welcome. Uh, I'm humbled to be here among all of you guys. Uh, flown halfway, maybe a third of the way across the world, across the planet. Um, you know, in uh, the spring of 2002, I was a special effects technician working on one of the sequels to The Matrix, hoping it would be good. Uh, and I got a call from a colleague of mine, Jamie Heineman, saying that he had been approached by the Discovery Channel to do this little show called Mythbusters. Uh, it sounded like a terrible name to me, but it was an interesting idea. Yeah. And uh, he said they would like to see a demo reel. I said, I could come in next week. He said, no, actually, they really want to see a demo reel by Friday. So I went into his shop the next day. I took the day off work, and I took a couple of video cameras, and we shot uh, for about an hour and a half. What's funny about that video is that uh, uh, Discovery loved it the moment they got it. The production company loved it. The camera crew showed up three weeks later, and we started filming Mythbusters in the summer of 2002. And we have pretty much never stopped filming Mythbusters. Uh, we shoot 215 days a year for the last nine years. Uh, and if you watch that original demo reel, it's actually sort of indistinguishable from, from the show that you see now. In it, uh, I annoy Jamie. Uh, we light something on fire, we blow it up, we run away from it. We come back, we put it out. And actually, the explosions weren't something that we had planned to put in the show, except that in one of the pilots, we blew something up. And so the first network, we, network note we got was, this is great, we're going to order 13 episodes, and we want you to blow something up in every single one. Uh, somewhere in the middle of that first season, which was working six days a week, 12 hours a day, uh, we all almost died because we were so tired, but we were doing a myth about throwing a penny off the Empire State Building. And if you throw a penny off an extremely high building, it can kill you when it hits the ground. So, of course, the soul of this story is how fast can a penny fall 
through the air. What is a penny's terminal velocity? And it turns out that a penny has two terminal velocities. It has one terminal velocity when it's on its face, and it has another one when it's on its edge. And we had some lovely complicated math that had been done by a NASA scientist who had tried this out and had done the, the figures for us. And we had traveled to film another interview. And on our way back on the plane, I was thinking about this. This is really only about four months in. I'm not even sure Mythbusters had aired at this point. We were still filming the first episodes. But I was thinking, it doesn't seem like it's enough to me that we just have this math that describes that a penny falls at uh, you know, 50 kilometers per hour at this, uh, in this orientation and 90 kilometers per hour at this orientation. I, I wanted something more than that. And I thought, you know, maybe I could build, maybe I could show rather than tell. That seems to be what we want to do because it's television. So maybe I can design a wind tunnel that can do this. So I went back to the shop and I took a clear plexiglass tube and drilled holes in it and put a huge fan underneath. The idea was that the holes would let some of the airspeed out as it was going up. Uh, and with the addition of a tongue depressor across the top, it worked exactly like that. I was able to get the, the high wind speed at the bottom and the low wind speed at the top and low when I put a penny in it, it tumbled up and down. It did exactly what I expected it to do. And this was the moment that I credit with the first time I sort of started to understand what my, what my job was. And it was also the moment that I realized that, that I might be able to contribute something to this show. That this was an idea that was mine. It was a, a, a thing, an, an, an addition to the understanding of a penny that was physical, it was visceral. It's how I understand things. It's how I have to understand things. I can read them and I can look at the math and I can parse it, but I have to do it. I have to get my hands dirty. And every great machinist, engineer, scientist will tell you that only when you understand something on a physical level, when you understand it with your body, do you really fully understand it. Over the years, I have collected stories of exactly that type of physicalization of the science because to me it is the most it's the most rewarding part about doing this show uh, we really don't know what's going to happen most of the time I will tell you we just did a myth a couple of weeks ago from the Pirates of the Caribbean in which uh, in the second movie some pirates are, are captured in a bone cage and they have to swing the cage over to the side of a ravine and catch it and climb to safety um, I, I'm not going to reveal to you exactly how the story went, but we made very clear assumptions about all three of the things that are done. The swinging, the catching, and the climbing. And we were wrong about two out of three of them. We were 100% wrong about two out of three of them. And that, to us, is one, some of the best days on the show when we are completely wrong. In, when he was a young boy, uh, the American physicist Richard Feynman was walking down the street in Queens, New York with his father and he was pulling a wagon with a ball. And he noticed that when he pulled the wagon, the ball went to the back of the wagon. Pulled the wagon, the ball went to the back and he said to his dad, what is, what is that that's happening? And his dad said, that's inertia. And he said, what's inertia? And his dad said, ah, inertia is the name that scientists give to the phenomenon of the ball moving to the back of the wagon. But in truth, he said, nobody really knows. And Feynman went on to earn degrees from MIT, uh, Princeton. He worked on the Manhattan Project.